Imagine living your whole life hearing exoplanets are dots in data, nothing more. And then one day seeing a nearby world with shape, texture and weather of its own. That is what the James Webb Space Telescope just handed us for Proxima Centauri b, the closest known exoplanet to Earth, only a little over four light years away. For years, Proxima b was a whisper in the numbers. Wobble in a star, a hint in a light curve, a circle drawn on a diagram. Now, after a deep, coordinated observing campaign, we finally have a direct image. Faint, filtered and false colour, yes, but undeniably a world. It is hard to overstate how big a step that is. Let's set the stage. Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, a small, cool star that sits in the Alpha Centauri system, our nearest stellar neighbour in cosmic terms. Proxima b orbits close to that star. So close, it likely keeps one face always turned toward the light, the way the moon keeps one face toward Earth. For years, we call Proxima b potentially habitable because its orbit sits in the zone where liquid water could exist. That was a model, a maybe. Models matter, but they're still guesses. An image is different. It pulls a world out of the math and puts it in the mind. How did JWST do it? With patience, precision and some clever tricks. Webb's instruments, especially NIR CAM in the near infrared and MIRI in the mid infrared, watched Proxima Centauri for long stretches using coronographs and custom image processing to block the star's glare. Multiple roll angles let scientists rotate the scene and subtract the star's light from itself. Dozens of exposures were aligned and stacked. New calibration routines tracked tiny optical shifts. The result is not a vacation snapshot. It is a masterpiece of subtraction and signal rescue. But within that data, what used to be a statistical blip resolves as a faint disk, Proxima b showing temperature differences, bright and dark patches, and even hints of clouds. What do we actually see? Across the day side, the image shows zones of different brightness. Brighter where it's warmer, dimmer where it's cooler or more reflective. That pattern alone is remarkable. Simple models of a tidally locked planet predict a blinding hotspot centered at the substellar point and a freezing night side. The JWST image suggests more nuance. The temperature transitions look smoother than expected. That implies one of two things, or a mix of both. A thicker atmosphere than we assumed, capable of stirring warm air from the day side to the night side, or surface and interior processes, rock, lava, topography that store and move heat. Either way, the dead rock picture no longer fits. There are darker regions too. Possibly basaltic plains or ancient lava flows, the frozen footprints of past eruptions. Along the mid-latitudes, faint banded features pop out in some filters, like ridges or tectonic seams. Tectonics on a world around a flare-happy red dwarf? That was not on most people's bingo card. Yet, the surface textures fit iron-rich and silicate signatures in the infrared, which are consistent with volcanic and tectonic histories. If verified by follow-on spectroscopy, that would place Proxima b in a very special category, a small rocky world with an active interior beyond our solar system. Look closely at some bright patches hovering above those darker stretches. They behave like transient semi-reflective overlays. In plain terms, they look like clouds. That is enormous. Clouds mean an atmosphere thick enough to hold vapour and cycle it, at least in patches. The skeptic's voice is important here. Clouds in a processed infrared image are an inference, not a photograph of fluff. But if later observations keep catching those bright overlays moving in time-lapse, atmospheric circulation moves from maybe to probable. This raises a huge question. How does a planet so close to a flare-prone red dwarf keep an atmosphere at all? Red dwarfs are famous for blasting their planets with charged particles and UV light. Over time, that can strip air. Three main answers exist. 1. A strong magnetic field shields due air. 2. The interior keeps venting gases that rebuild the atmosphere as it erodes. Or 3. The initial atmosphere was massive and thick, a heavy weight that takes a long time to peel away. The JWST image can't choose between these options yet. But the very fact the planet shows a smooth thermal gradient and possible clouds suggests it has not been stripped bare. What about water? No one has imaged lakes and seas, we should say that out loud. But spectral fingerprints embedded in the image 
hint that trace gases consistent with carbon dioxide and possibly water vapor. Caution is essential. CO2 can live in air without oceans and water lines are tricky to confirm through glare and noise. The good news is that JWST can follow up with targeted spectroscopy to search for water's signature more cleanly. If future passes catch seasonal or daily shifts in reflectivity along the terminator, the line between day and night, that will strengthen the case for active weather and perhaps liquid water in eyeball patterns along the eternal twilight strip. One surprise sits off the side of the image and belongs to orbital mechanics. The light pattern across the disk is not centered the way a perfect tidally locked world would be. Some modelers argue this points to a resonant spin, not a strict one-to-one -one lock. A rhythm more like Mercury's 3 to 2 resonance. The data are young, conclusions are premature. But even the possibility of a resonance makes the climate story richer. Alternating periods of light and dark, even short ones, help an atmosphere stay moving and a surface avoid the extremes of permanent day and night. All of this rests on careful color choices. The JWST image is false color, meaning the hues represent different wavelengths beyond human sight. Some filters emphasize heat, others stress surface minerals, still others bring out aerosols and clouds. The team did not paint this world for beauty. They picked palettes that teach. By watchful comparison, they traced how light bounces off different materials and how air scatters it. In that sense, the image is a map and a textbook chapter at once. If you care about the big picture, this moment rewrites the risk-reward balance for red dwarf planets. For years, many scientists ranked them low too close to flares, too likely to be airless, too tidally bullied. Proxima b does not prove Red Dwarf's host Earth 2.0s by the dozen, but it tells us not to count them out. Red Dwarfs are the most common stars in the galaxy. If even a fraction of their planets keep air and move heat, we just widen the field for life by a lot. That changes the math and maybe the philosophy of the search. There is a cultural dimension here too. The first time humanity saw Earth rise over the moon in Apollo photography, it shifted how we thought of ourselves. The pale blue dot did it again, shrinking our certainties to a single pixel in a vast sea. Proxima B's image makes a different point. Other worlds are not just dots, they are places. They can be mapped, learned, argued over, imagined. The classrooms that once taught exoplanets with stick figures and guesses can now show a real neighbour with textures and weather and say this is what four light years looks like. Technically, this is also a giant go for the next generation of telescopes. Luar and Habex, future missions proposed to do exactly this kind of imaging and spectroscopy, now have a blueprint. Webb proved we can block out a nearby star's glare long enough to see a rocky planet's thermal glow. Ground-based giants like the Extremely Large Telescope will build on that with adaptive optics and huge mirrors to catch more light and split it finer. The roadmap feels less like fantasy and more like a series of engineering checkboxes. In the meantime, JWST's work is not done. Plan to see time-lapse sequences in the coming months. Rotation hints, cloud shifts, changes at the limb, the edge of the disk as the planet moves through different star-planet observer angles. If clouds come and go, we will notice. If the heat gradient shifts with stellar flares, we will watch the planet respond. We may even catch the subtle signature of seasonal changes, though season around a red dwarf may mean something very different than it does here. Yes, we should talk ethics even at four light years. No one is sending a probe to Proxima B anytime soon, but visibility precedes action. When we can see a place, we start to plan for it. Planetary protection policies have mostly been solar system focused. As a tool stretch out, do we need to write early voluntary agreements about how to treat nearby potentially habitable worlds? If future spectra suggest biology, even at the level of methane oxygen imbalances or other disequilibria, what counts as do not disturb at interstellar distances? These are thought experiments now. They'll be policy debates later. Beyond the academy and agencies, the private sector is already pointing at Proxima B as a North Star. Laser sail concepts like Breakthrough Starshot gain credibility when there's a clear target. Deep space communication startups can design for the delay and data volumes needed when the science is not just a dot, but a disk. Even energy companies dabbling in beamed power imagine their tech one day pushing wafer craft out of the solar system. A planet you can see is a better sales pitch than a spreadsheet. Let's keep our feet on the ground though. The image is glorious, but it is not an answer key. We still need spectroscopy to confirm air and what's in it, 
We still need time to tease out spin and tilt. We still need to watch how Proxima's flares hammer the planet and how the planet copes. This could be a dynamic world with a stubborn atmosphere and slow, careful weather. It could also be a world clinging to air in patches, a place where life would need to be rugged and lucky. Both stories are worth chasing, neither is guaranteed. The most inspiring shift may be in how we teach and imagine. Artists are already building full renderings from the data, extending the real into the plausible. Iron-rich rocks under crimson light, thin clouds running like silk along the Terminator, a dim sun twice the width of our own in the sky. Planetariums are scripting shows where visitors walk across a digital Proxima B, built from web's maps. Storytellers have a portrait now, not a placeholder. That matters, because it turns jargon into pictures and pictures into curiosity. If you're wondering what comes next, here's a simple list. JWST will aim for direct spectroscopy of the disk, looking for specific gases. CO2, H2O, maybe even hints of methane or oxygen if we get very lucky. Observations will repeat to catch changes. Weather, rotation, response to flares. Ground telescopes will try for polarimetry, which tells us about cloud particle sizes and surface textures. Modelers will hammer at the data, testing resonance spins and heat circulation, and the exoplanet community will re-rank targets. Which nearby worlds deserve a second look with this level of patience? One more thought, humble and hopeful. We got here because nations, agencies and thousands of people agreed to spend decades and billions of dollars on a machine parked a million miles from Earth. Cold nearly to absolute zero, aligned by light and software. Every pixel in this image is a vote for cooperation. Every filter color is a reminder that patient, public science, can change how a species thinks about itself. That is not a small thing in a loud world. So yes, it is just a picture. But like the first earth rise and the pale blue dot, it's also a door. Behind it stand ethics, engineering, art, hope, and the very specific work of measuring instead of dreaming. Proxima B is still a mystery. It is now finally a visible one. A nearby world with form and weather and questions we can point at. Four light years is far. For the first time, it feels a little bit like a neighborhood we can sketch. And the best part, this is the closest star beyond our sun. If we can pull a world out of that glare, we can do it elsewhere. 10 light years, 50, 100. Each image won't just show a planet, it will show us where our tools and our curiosity can go. That's the real breakthrough. We're not only hearing about other worlds anymore, we're seeing them. We're learning to read their faces.